Well, good morning, St. Pete First family, and happy Sunday. It is good to see each and every one of you here and worship this morning on a chilly morning, but glad you all made it here here in person. And those joining us online for where, wherever you are tuning in, welcome. God is present wherever you are, and we are glad that you are worshiping with us virtually. Before we begin our time of worship with one another, I have several announcements. First, do not forget to wear your name badges. We have a new senior pastor, and he's trying to get to know everyone, and it's very helpful when we wear name badges, and even for me. So, so be sure to do that, and if you need a name badge, order forms are on the information tables if you would like one. Next, our communications director, Kelly Benyatta, has been hard at work on our website, and she's constantly been updating it, and it's full of wonderful, wonderful things. So be sure to go check out our new and improved website, and for further information that isn't talked about here on Sunday morning, uh, tune into our website and see what all is going on in the life of the church. And last, but certainly not least, my Bible study is starting this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. in room 208. We will be digging into the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, a book full of wisdom. So I hope to see some of you there. We will also be uh, doing it on Facebook Live. So if you can't attend in person for whatever reason, you can tune into Facebook. And it will also be uploaded uh, to Facebook uh, after, after the study is finished as well. Last but certainly not least, uh, we've had several deaths in our congregation over the past week. The first was Thur Young, and I believe we have, there, there's Thur. Thur was a member here, and he attended the 8 a.m. service often with his wife. He was an attorney, an avid history lover, and especially uh, loved reading the Bible. So his service is still to be determined, so be on a lookout for, for Thur's service soon. And also Tom Nelson passed away this past week as well. Tom and his wife were very active in Celebrate Recovery and helping uh, to serve meals for Celebrate Recovery. Tom's service will be held here in the sanctuary on February 11th. Um, so please be in prayer and lift up Thur and Tom and their families, friends, and loved ones as they deal with an immense loss in their lives. But let's begin our time of worship with one another and going to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we meet as a family in your presence this morning. We meet as brothers and sisters in Christ, accepting the responsibility this places upon us to love one another as you have loved us. We meet as your light in this dark world and pray that through our words and our lives, others might be drawn into your family and, and accept you as their Savior and Lord. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's turn and greet one another with the peace and love of Christ. Good morning, let's stay standing. We are gonna celebrate this morning. I feel like great things are just gonna happen today in this service, and we are gonna celebrate, we're gonna lift our voices as we celebrate our great, great God.
Promises that he will be with us through anything, everything we go to. There is nothing that is too big for our great God.
lift our voices together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. And you may be seated. I'd like to invite the, the ushers forward as we present God with our tithes and our offerings this morning. And as they're coming forward, it is the fifth Sunday this month, so part of our offering will go to the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. And this is a wonderful organization that helps abuse, neglected, and abandoned children and um, really transforms their lives and leads them to Christ. Our gifts, our time, our talents, really make a difference in this world and in the life of this church as well. 
Our Christmas diaper drive was a huge success. Almost 3,000 diapers were donated. So thank you for, for giving in that way. And also our street ministry team has been hard at work with their offering their time to our homeless friends and 51 volunteers in the month of December and 416 meals were cooked and served. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for, for worshiping God with your time, your talents, your gifts, and your finances. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Faithful Father, thank you that you give the gift of abundant eternal life. You have said that you are a good father who gives us good gifts. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you now, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given to us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O, o Lord, our God. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength be unto you, our God, forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I know you all are sitting, but if you feel led to stand, you stand. But I hope sitting, standing, you will continue to worship with us. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You guys just play just for a second, a little bit more, please. So as, um, as our folks are playing a little bit, you know, today's a day that we're going to talk about a, a, a subject that's going to really pierce our hearts. In case you haven't picked the, tune, uh, the theme up yet, it's healing. We need healing, don't we? Healing is probably the one thing we need most of but we're too afraid to ask. Here's why. Because the world says that if you show weakness or if you cry or uh, if you're disturbed in your soul that, that, that you're just to be cast aside and you're, you're a nobody. You know why we can cry? Because the scripture said Jesus wept. Right? So I want us to continue a culture here at St. Pete First that we recognize that, that there's power in healing. I want us to recognize that when we come to the chancellor, to the altar, and someone's in prayer, that that if you see somebody there, I I want you just to kind of just pray for that person as they come and they kneel. We don't know what's happening, but we know that we can be a part of their healing. And and if they happen to be there a little bit, you don't need my permission, but I'm going to say it's okay to go up and just put your hand on their back softly, reassure them that they're not alone. And sometimes we want to come to the altar and we want to pray and and just kind of have alone time with God. There's other times, maybe we want to just lift a hand. If you see a hand lifted up, listen, in the name of Jesus, let's create a culture that we can go up and touch them in love. So healing is so important. And, and as I think about not only our world and our nation, I think about our church here. I think about our community. What a powerful way that we can be together today. I want to thank Tiffany and our praise team for for just moving us and ushering us into this this space that we can feel God's presence and to know that's there. So let me encourage you to bow your head. If you're at home, thank you for being with us today as well as you're live streaming. You're a part of this church family. If you're here in this room, thank you for um, beating the cold air and coming out here. But let's pray together. Lord God. Jehovah Rapha, the God of healing, we pray in your holy name that whatever shackles us and binds us by chains, that we are set free, that we can come to the altar and experience and know by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that we have been healed. So set us free today, God, as we talk about being fulfilled and and the pathway to healing in the love language of James the half-brother of Jesus. So walk with us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, we're in our week three of Fulfilled. We're talking about the path to healing today, okay? And we're going to find ourselves in James chapter 5. James is one of those books that I think is a real life changer. It's one of those books that um, if you're not familiar with the scriptures, go to James. It's in the back of the Bible. Read it. It talks about 
how we're supposed to love each other, but, but that we're all equals at the foot of the cross. But today, we're going to look at uh, chapter 5 and talk about healing. Let's look at what James has to say about this pathway to healing. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are you happy? Sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. And such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. Did you hear that? Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. The Lord will make you well, and if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Sometimes we forget that sin is something that needs healing of. It's not just the physical things, but it's also that. Confess your sins, James says to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So what he's talking about here is he's not talking about standing in front of the church and telling the whole church about your dirty laundry. What he's really talking about is that intimate confession. Confess to God if it's a sin against God. Confess to the person that you've committed the sin against and work through that. He says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I take that one a little bit further because, because I know that, you know, <clears throat> as much as we want to be righteous people, we're not perfect. So I, I look at that and I say the prayers in the name of the righteous one, Jesus Christ, we can be healed. So prayer, prayer was something that was very important to James. In fact, legend has it that he had a nickname, and this is a legend and it said that his nickname was Camel Knees because he had such great calluses on his knees because he spent so much time in prayer. So prayer was one of those things that, that James really um, moved into. Prayer is powerful. It transforms lives. It heals broken relationships. Prayer is one of those things that can penetrate our sickness. Prayer is one of those things that can actually set us free and heal us in the ways in which we need to be healed. You know, I'm often asked, Pastor, do you, do you think God can heal me? Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said that, that we have the power to heal in his name, but we also have the power to do even greater things because of him. Not on our own, but because of him. So James is, is bringing these things into, into perspective, and he says that we can do this through prayer. So let's, let's walk through a couple of things uh, with prayer today. Here's what James says about prayer. James says that, that pray when you're broken emotionally. Pray when you're broken emotionally. Verse 13, are you hurting? If you're hurting, James says, that's when you need to pray. The Greek word is translated to mean to suffer misfortune or to be in dire distress. So, so when you're hurting like that, when you're hurting emotionally, you are dire at the end of your rope. You are hurting in such a powerful way. You are screaming for somebody to please listen that I am not okay. And James says it's at, at that moment that you are called to pray. He's, he's talking about internal distresses that are caused by external circumstances. The economy collapses. It, that's an external thing. It affects you internally. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to pay my rent? Can I feed my kids? He's talking about external circumstances that, that affect us internally. Someone that you're in a relationship with, something's happened and that relationship now is fractured. That external circumstance has affected you internally. He's talking about that as the need to pray emotionally. David said in Psalm 18, 4, in my distress, I call to the Lord. A later Psalm, it says that God draws near to the brokenhearted. And so we see that this is something that's really important. So when we have um, tensions in our lives, when we, when we think that things aren't going well, we have a choice. We can either swear or we can have prayer. Those are the two choices that we have. James also says that, okay, it's not just emotionally. James says pray when you're broken physically. Broken, when you're broken physically. He says that the, the translation is, is very important. So I want to take us to the message. Eugene Peters, his translation is the message. I, I use that sometimes because it really breaks it down into our common language, okay? So, so Peter says this. He says, Peterson says, are you sick? Call all the leaders of the church together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master, so James says that when you're sick, call upon the elders of the church, so that's the first clue, and do it in the name of the master who is Jesus, believing that prayer will heal you, and Jesus will put you on your feet. 
So whatever that ailment is, um, Jesus will somehow find a way to get you moving again into a direction of healing. It may not be physically like if you can't use your legs that, that all of a sudden you'd be able to jump for joy, although anything's possible with God. But it means that move it, move it forward in, in a way that will change your life. He says, believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Sometimes we don't talk about sin in church. I don't know why. Maybe we're afraid that it might hurt somebody. But, you know, sin is one of those things that we learn in Genesis that kind of started the whole need for a Savior. <laughs> so when we talk about sin, it's not to rub it in. It's not to be accusatory. But it's really to help open eyes that maybe are dimmed that they can see the need of a Savior in Jesus Christ. So... The, the word sick in Greek literally means without strength. So, so James is talking about a serious illness here. He's talking about a physical illness that's got you so down that you can't get out of bed. The kind of illness that, that you just can't move around, but, but you've got you've to, it's beyond the help of a doctor. And he says, so if it's that kind of illness, then you need to be praying. And the elders of the church are to come and pray over you and anoint you with oil. And this is where we learn about this importance of oil. You know, oil is, is a symbol that we use throughout the life of the church. It's, it's biblical. And oil is something that makes sense for us. So James says that there's really three kinds of sickness, or really the scriptures, I should say, tell us that there's three kinds of sickness. There's sickness for death. This is the kind of sickness that just is beyond all medical ability, and it takes us home to be with God. And that kind of sickness does happen. That's the kind of sickness that we read about in, in John eleven four, 4, when, when the sisters call upon Jesus and say, come, our, our brother Lazarus, your good friend, is, is very sick. And, and Jesus, for whatever reason, he's just kind of meandering around, and, and he waits a couple of days, and then he finally gets on the journey to go be with Lazarus. Lazarus is dead. The King James translation says, he's not only dead, but his body stinketh, okay? So he's like, necrosis is setting in. And Jesus comes and, and he weeps over that. So it's a kind of illness that's beyond the ability. Some people will say, but if you just only had enough faith, if you had enough faith, then you would be made well. But think about that. I know a lot of people that have a lot of faith and they still die. Death is something that happens to us. We're not, we're not made to live forever in this life. So even with that, so there's a sickness for the purpose of taking people home. Then there's a sickness for discipline. This is, comes out of 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 32. And Paul is talking to a church that, that just is just nonsensical. They're just getting into a big mess. They're fighting over, you know, dietary laws, and they're talking about idolatry and all sorts of things, and, and all these gods and, and things that they're dealing with, and, and they're abusing the Lord's Supper, and Paul says, because you're abusing the Lord's Supper, because you are not using the sacrament in the way in which God intends, you're going to become sick. And he does. So, so God disciplines sometimes through sickness. Then there's sickness uh, to the glory of God. And this is the kind of sickness that comes where, where through someone's illness or their sickness, a miracle happens. Now listen, miracles happen today. Sometimes we just overlook them because we get so carried away with the stuff that we're involved in that we overlook the miracles that are actually occurring. Miracles happen today. People are healed today. So this, so this thing, sickness to the glory of God, this is the kind of story like in John chapter 9 when Jesus heals the blind man at the pool of Siloam. He takes, he spits in the ground, not very sanitary, makes mud, puts it on the guy's eyes, he washes and he can see. And, and, and that kind of sickness is done so that God can be glorified. And we learned that through that whole experience that, that the reason why this happened was so that the world could see one of the perspectives of what God can do. Bring that. So what does James say when we're in the, in the need of healing? He says we are to call the elders of the church. We have a couple of references in the scripture, 1 Peter 5, Acts 20, Titus 2, all tell us about the structure of the church. And it tells us that some are called to be elders, uh, presbyteros, they're called to be elders in a sense of hierarchy of through ordination, to be set apart from all others. 
And James says that you call upon the spiritual leaders of your church to come and pray for you. So when you are really sick, when you're at that point where you've got nothing else you can do to, to, to remedy that, he says, call upon the elders of the church. But here's what I love. You know, who does the calling? It's the person who's sick. You who are sick are to call the elders of the church to come anoint you. You know, years ago I found out something very early in ministry, and that is that hospitals don't call churches to say, somebody in your church family is in ICU and getting ready to die. I've been yelled at by parishioners sometime in the past, well, why didn't you know that, why didn't you come see me when I was in blah, blah, blah in the hospital? Well, I didn't know. Who'd you tell? Nobody. So, so when we're sick, we're to call upon the elders of the church. When we can't get out of bed, we call upon the spiritual leaders of the church to come to our home and to pray over us. This is what's called like a, a house call. And this is the whole beautiful part of why it's so important to be a part of a local church. You know, we talk about the church universal, the church capital C. But what does it mean to be a part of the local church? When we're a part of the local church, we then can be ministered to by the local body, the people in our local community, the people that we can connect with. And we see in the sense of that, that, that really what this says is that there is an importance to be a part of the local church. Yeah, you can listen to podcasts. Yeah, you can listen to Joel on the internet, whoever you want to listen to, you know, it does, but, but the scriptures say, be a part of a local church. Don't wander around, but connect. And therefore, when you have a need, you can call upon the elders to pray for you. James says, anyone who is sick, so anyone who's in the need of healing should call the church's elders. The church should pray, or they should pray for, and pour oil on the person in the name of the Lord. Oil. It's a symbol in the scriptures of the Holy Spirit. When we baptize somebody, we seal the Holy Spirit in them. Holy Spirit, work within you that being born by water and spirit, you may arise and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oil is used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Juice and bread is used as a symbol of holy communion, of the blood and the body of Jesus. Water is used as a symbol of baptism, of death and new life. But oil, oil all throughout, even in Revelation, the church of Laodicea is accused of being neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. And they had developed this eye salve that was supposedly healing people, but it had lost its luster. So there's another example of oil in the scriptures. But we see that, that oil is one of those things. It's, it's a tool that we use. And therefore, if anyone is sick, we are called to, to bring and to place oil upon him. Let's go back into the Gospels, the story of the Good Samaritan. Some of you may that. Um, a man is, is traveling on the road of Jericho and Jerusalem, and, and on the way there, he, he happens to um, come under the attack of a band of, of, of thieves. And they, like, beat him to a pulp. They don't kill him, but they beat him probably close near death. They rob him, they strip him and everything. And a Samaritan comes, and not only does he bind up the wounds, but he does what? He puts oil. He puts oil on it. And uses oil as a symbol of healing. The Bible says if I'm hurting emotionally, if you're hurting emotionally, we should pray. We should pray when we're hurting physically. We should pray when we have a major illness. We should pray, and we should call upon the elders of the church. But what about the third hurt? There's three hurts here. Here's the third one. Pray when you're broken spiritually. You know, we can say, okay, I know when I'm physically broken. I know when I'm emotionally broken. But how do I know when I'm spiritually broken? When we're spiritually broken, we're focusing more on ourselves and on our needs than we are on God. When we're broken spiritually, we're, we're not acting in the way of Christ, the way that Christ calls us. That fruit of the Spirit is not upon us. And we're acting on our own. We're broken spiritually. And some people are broken spiritually. Some people are broken spiritually because of what someone else has done to them. And one of the greatest challenges that I see that people are broken spiritually is whenever we want to demean another person we want to destroy the imago dei the image of god in them and we want them to be convinced that they are not created in the image of god it doesn't matter that's how you can be broken spiritually you listen to that long enough you're going to be broken spiritually 
in Jesus' day, we find out that this was prevalent, and it's prevalent today. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed, and the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So sometimes we need prayer because we're sinning. And that breaks us spiritually. Because sin is separation from God. Sin is God is here and we are here, and sin destroys the path between us and God. The cross of Jesus is the bridge that takes us to God. It, it's the gap. It, it, divide, it brings the gap together. So when we sin, we, we destroy that, and, and God is there, and, and we, are, we can't be in the presence of God because God is holy. So we're destroyed spiritually. Some people will say that if there's something wrong with you, if, if you have a sickness or an impairment or, or um, you're born a certain way, that, that that means you have sin in your life. Some churches teach that. There are some people who will say that, that, you know, you've got something wrong with you and therefore that's why you're sick. Listen to what Jesus said. He comes upon the man who's blind and the disciples say, Lord, who sinned, this man's father or mother, that he was born blind? And what did Jesus say? It's not about that. He said, because today... His ailment, his blindness is going to be healed. And people will see the power of the Father. And that's why when healing happens, we don't give ourselves the glory. That's why we need to be careful if we, if we go and, and someone says, I've healed you, and they're taking all the glory. That's, that's a false healing. Because God gets the glory. Not me, not you, not another. God gets the glory. On the other hand, Jesus said, hey, Sickness can come when we make the wrong choices. If we abuse drugs, if we abuse alcohol, if we do things that, that are against our bodies or whatever the case may be, there's going to be an outcome of that. And because of the way that we've chosen to live or to do, we might have sickness in our life. And so we're, we need to be aware of this. You see, it says... Don't be anxious about anything. So when the scripture says don't be anxious about anything, if I'm worrying about, if I'm fretting over things, if I'm kind of mulling it over in my stomach, if I'm just constantly frying over those kind of things, you know, it, it, it can build up resentment, it can build up a lot of things. And we know that resentment isn't something that's any good for us at all. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And whenever we kind of like uh, worry and fret and just kind of like um, mess around with stuff that's uh, an impact to our life, it really can harm us. And doctors say that it's not what you eat, it's what's eating you that's going to kill you. So healing can bring this. How many of you know what a golf ball looks like? Three of you. There are only three golfers? Well, here, here's a picture. Look at that. Just in case you didn't know what a golf ball looked like. There you go. Notice the one on the one side that's, that's pristine, and the one on the, the other side is kind of beat up. Now, if it was my golf ball, it'd have like road on it and mortar from a house and probably some glass from a window that I broke or something like that. Did you know when they first developed the golf ball, it was smooth? It was like a cue ball. It wasn't heavy like a cue ball, but it was smooth like that. And they started using that as a golf ball, but what they couldn't do is they couldn't get a whole lot of velocity out of it. They couldn't get a lot of distance out of it. So then what they discovered was if we just kind of rough it up a little bit, if we dimple it, that's the term, if we dimple it, then when we hit it, it can go further and it can really do what we want to do. And, and I kind of liken that to, to, to our story here that, that, you know, we're like golf balls. That we get dimples by our hurts. We get dimples by our sicknesses. We get dimples by the things. And because of that, we have longevity for life. We can pursue those things. We can see that life can make sense and we can go the distance. So we talked about healing. I want to kind of segue for a second into another term called brokenness. Say brokenness. Say it one more time. Brokenness. At home, I hope you said that as well. Brokenness. Brokenness is another word. It kind of intertwines with healing. So James is also talking about brokenness. And brokenness is one of those things that if you've ever experienced brokenness in your life, you know where I'm going with this. Brokenness is when you're kind of like flat on the ground and, and, and you're like 
prostrate on the ground crying and you just can't get up because you were so overwhelmed and weeping. Brokenness, brokenness. Everyone experiences brokenness. Listen to me. Everyone experiences brokenness. Don't ever let anybody tell you, well, I don't ever have any brokenness, but you do. No, no. We all experience brokenness. Brokenness is something that we can't uh, get away from. And it's out of that brokenness that God shapes our life. It's in the brokenness where we find out how we can't take care of ourselves. It's in the brokenness that we find out we can't save ourselves. It's in the brokenness we find out how fragile we really are and that we need God. And so brokenness plays a significant part in our lives. But brokenness, some people say it's an illusion. It's a mirage. It it doesn't exist. It's not out there. But listen to me, it does. Brokenness does. Here's the second piece of brokenness. Brokenness doesn't last forever. Now think about a time in your life when you were broken, okay? Think about a time when you were broken, not sad, broken. When you were broken, in that brokenness, you likely thought, this is the end. I can't turn it around. Nothing good will come of this. I might as well just pack it all up and cash it in. This is, it's, it's done, it's over. You see, Every valley has its lows, every peak has its highs, life has its ups and downs. But brokenness does not last forever. In fact, brokenness will always end. It may not end in the time zone that you're asking for it to, it may not end on the exact time that you think it should, but brokenness will always end. And so it's, it's through that valley experience, it's through that that we find out that, that we learn that, that brokenness teaches us that it's painful but it's not permanent and that we can actually move through that So your brokenness will not live forever, but you will. Here's the next one. Your brokenness is gonna change you. Brokenness will change you. Brokenness never leaves you the way it finds you. Let me take us to the story of Joseph, one of the many sons of of Jacob, the youngest son, the one one son that, that Father Jacob loved the most, Rachel's son. And Gave him a coat of many colors. And, and so all the brothers were tending out into the fields, and Joseph, the youngest brother, finds them, and they're his older brothers. And he comes in with this wild story that, that he, will, he saw in a dream that they will one day bow down to him. Well, the older brothers didn't like to hear that at all, the younger brother saying what he said. And, and so what they do, they, they throw him into a pit, and they think they're going to kill him, but then they come up with the idea, you know, hey, why don't we just sell him into slavery? They sell him in slavery into Egypt. They go home and they tell Father Jacob that that he was killed by a pack of wild animals. And Jacob weeps. He's broken. Joseph then, in the midst of his his situation, finds Pharaoh's favor. and, And he rises up into the hierarchy of Egypt, becomes the number one person under Pharaoh over all Egypt. A Hebrew. And all of a sudden, a famine comes in. And Joseph has control of the grains. And all the people come, his brothers come representing his family. We need grain or we won't survive. They don't recognize Joseph, their brother, who is now the one that they're speaking to on behalf of Egypt. And you can imagine that in the midst of that, Joseph might have been thinking about his own brokenness. He might have been thinking about his rage as to what he could do to get his brothers back. He he could have ordered them killed. He could have done anything. But what the story tells us is that he ultimately gives them the grain that they need. And then they find out who he is. And the story convinces us that from the moment that Joseph told his brothers that vision to the moment that it was disclosed who he was, that he was a changed man. God used that situation to change Joseph. Here's the last one we learn. You can choose what your brokenness will do to you. You can choose what your brokenness will do to you. You can either like be Eeyore and live in the sky is falling, chicken little, you know, all those acronyms or all those uh, metaphors that we could use. You could just walk around kind of thinking like, you know, uh, it's going to rain on my parade and all those things. How you deal with it, you will choose what your brokenness will do to you. Yes, there are times that we can't control our brokenness. There are times we cannot control the things that break us. But what we can control is how we're going to respond. It was once said you can either uh, turn your pain into profanity or you can turn it into poetry. How do you see it? Is the glass half empty or is it half full? Use some of the phrases that we kick around today. 
But how you see that is a lot up to you. The choice is yours. It's not my choice for you. It's your choice for you. How will you deal with that brokenness? And James would say, call upon the elders of the church. Let them anoint you with oil, that the prayers of a righteous person will help you to be healed. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're not just going to listen to what the Bible says. We're going to actually do what the Scripture says. So Pastor Margaret and I, according to the Scriptures, are the ones that you're to call. We are called the elders of the church. And so today, we want to offer the opportunity for you to be anointed with oil. Now here's what that means. Whether it's a physical healing that you're seeking, a spiritual or an emotional relational, economic, it doesn't matter. If you're in need of healing, we want to invite you to come forward down the center aisle and we will anoint you with oil today. And after we anoint you, if you want to go and, and, and kneel at the chancel and pray, let me encourage you to do that. And brothers and sisters, if you see one of your brothers and sisters kneeling and they look like they're there for a while, just go put your hand on them on top of their shoulder and just let them know I'm with you and then, then you can quietly leave. Those of you that are at home, here's what I want you to do. I want you to um, chat with us. Let us know what need that you have, how we can help heal you. It's a little hard for us to virtually anoint you with oil, but, but if you tell us what your need is, we will pray for you. And, and if you're in an area that we can respond to, we will do our best to come and to anoint you with oil. So as our praise team leads us in this final song, I want you to pray about what the Holy Spirit is saying to you today. We're not going to dismiss by rows. This is just kind of a, as the Spirit leads you, come and be anointed with oil. Let us pray as we prepare our hearts. So God, we know that you were in this place, and we know that you were, have shown up long before we were even here, before the lights came on, you were here. And your call for us today is to be healed. So I pray for my brothers and sisters who need that today, who need to be anointed with oil. And may our prayers together, bound by the one who is righteous in Jesus Christ, bring healing to those who are in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Come as the Spirit leads you.
Amen. Church, would you stand as you're able? Receive these words as you go into your day. May healing in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. And may you be a healing vessel to someone else today in his name. Go in peace, and the peace of Christ be with you. Amen and amen.